they in fact decorated me with the bronze star with V for valor. The only combat medal of valor the U.S. Army uh, conferred on a civilian during the entire Vietnam War. The Marines decorated three of my colleagues for much the same reason, rescuing wounded troops in battle under fire for their actions at the uh, battle for Way in Tet of 68. But for the Army, I've got the only one. I wear it with pride. You can see it right there. I wear it in memory of all of those correspondents who died in Vietnam. I started in the newspaper business uh, when I was just turned 17 uh, and, and uh, went to work on a daily newspaper and uh, that was 1959. And uh, 18 months later, I was hired by United Press International and sent to Kansas City, Missouri. Worked there for nine months and was sent to be the state house manager in Topeka, Kansas. I started in 1963 reading stories on the wire and I thought, you know, there's gonna be one hell of a war there. It's gonna become an American war. It will be my generation's war and I want to cover it. I started writing a letter a week to my bosses in New York. I begged, I pleaded, I threatened. I did everything that I could to keep my name in their inbox. All I wanted to do was get there. The phone rang and I picked it up. It was my boss in Dallas and he said, do you own a trench coat? And I, I didn't know what the hell that man was talking about. And I said, no. He said, well, you better buy one because uh, you're being transferred from Topeka to Tokyo, Asia Division headquarters as soon as you can get on a plane and go. I arrived in Tokyo in December of 1964, immediately asked the boss there for a transfer to Saigon. And he laughed. He said, you know, I just sent a second American reporter to Saigon, and I'm sure we'll never need any more than that. Uh, and I thought, well, let's just hide and watch. And that was December of 64. By March of 65, the 1st Battalion of Marines was landing in Da Nang. Uh, the first American troops on the Asian mainland since Korea. And uh, three weeks later, I was on a, pl on a plane to Saigon. I stopped for two days, got my press cards, and got on an Air Force Milk Run C-123 and flew north to Da Nang and spent the next six, seven months covering the U.S. Marines as they got to know the Viet Cong and the Vietnamese rice paddies and jungles and mountains. And I was learning along with them every day, out with the Marines on every operation they ran to include one combat amphibious assault landing, uh, which was pretty sporty. The Marines did not have a lot of helicopters. They walked to work and uh, I, I was with them. I was wearing out combat boots. They were assigning five correspondents to each battalion in the invasion force. And you had to sign a 36 page single space double sided set of rules. Now this must have taken a, a committee of JAG lawyers 
a whole year to put together. And I think I'm the only one who ever read the damn thing because nobody else did, including the battalion commanders. What would happen is you pitch up for your assignment to this Marine battalion and the Lieutenant Colonel commanding would sit down his five reporters and say, okay, here's how it's going to work my rules. I don't care about these rules from the Pentagon. And uh, in fact, it, it worked pretty good. I was working at the time for Knight Ritter newspapers and, and we sent 37 reporters and photographers to be embedded with the troops. We were there to, to basically report what was happening with the American troops, with the American war. What I saw were young men who many, you know, 60% of them were draftees. They didn't volunteer to come to this war. They got snatched up from whatever life they were living. Then they got a very short uh, army training and bang, they're on their way to Vietnam, as most of them as infantrymen carrying a rifle. And they were just doing their duty the best they could in a very bad war, a very long way from home. When their time was up and they came home, uh, the demonstrators uh, shouted rude things at them, and some of them spat at them. Basically, they went home and started their lives up again and built families, and built businesses, and became most of them very successful and started giving back to their communities, to the veterans community, a lot of people were turning against the war. Uh, a lot of Americans turned against the war. But I, I have to say that it was not on account of what the media was reporting. What turned the American people against the Vietnam War was the fact that all of those coffins were coming home to every little town in America and every big town too. Uh, uh, 30,000 Americans, boys, were being drafted each month and shipped to Vietnam and way too many of them were coming home in shiny gray army coffins. And, you know, the first one that came home to a little town, they had a parade and the fire trucks out there and the school let out and they all lined the streets and waved flags. And the second and the third and the fourth, <clears throat> they began to wonder how long is this going to go on and how much heavier price must we pay in our own sons uh, and, and slowly they turned against the war. You know, the whole point of the thing with the new book was, you know, there, it's less about these veterans' wars that they fought and more about the lives that they have lived and the good they have done for their communities and our country since that war. Even though they came home to no welcome, no respect, and in fact, uh, uh, almost libelous uh, generalizations about Vietnam veterans that they were all Lieutenant Callies, they're all baby killers. They, they, you know, I did four tours in Vietnam and I spent most of my time with soldiers in the field and I never saw that. General Moore and I were near the end of writing We Were Soldiers Once and Young and, and 
We needed to, we were going to publish in the front of the book the names and hometowns of every man who was killed in the Iadrang Valley battles, 305 of them. And uh, we needed to double check those names. And I knew that the Park Service sold a, a registry of every name on the wall. And so I was going to go to their kiosk there at the wall and buy that, that book to use for fact checking the names. And uh, I, I wasn't thinking right and I parked on the wrong side of the wall. Uh, so I had to walk the full length of the wall to get to that park service kiosk. And I got to panel three east and I froze like a deer in the headlights, just looking at those names. And what I realized was that I, I knew every one of them through our research. I knew their moms and dads. I, I knew what their dreams had been. And I couldn't move. I just stood there and wept. over all that we had lost. I, I look at the wall and, and I wonder what, what could they have done for our country if they had been allowed to work with their lives instead of giving their lives, if they were still with us, what would they have become? The wall to me is, is a beautiful work of art, but it breaks my heart every time. My old co-author, General Hal Moore, said, what America has to realize is that it's okay to hate war. No one hates war more than the soldier, because the soldier suffers the most from war. But you must never hate the warrior. You send your sons and today your daughters to war under your flag in the name of our country you you must respect their service you must welcome them home it can't be any other way